everybody. Welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we are at such a pleasure to have Dan Miguel Ruiz, who is an Igual, also a Toltec Master of Transformation. And um, I haven't seen Miguel in so long. It's so wonderful to be with you. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited. The last time we spoke, I think my body was like swirling around in a circle. That's how excited I was. <laughs> the energy was off the roof. Uh, okay. Um, so, you, TJ, uh, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure talking to you. I missed you. <laughs> yeah, I missed you too. So a little bit about your background. You're a direct descendant of the Toltecs of the Eagle Knight lineage, and you're the son of Don Miguel Ruiz, who is the author of the book, The Four Agreements. And we're here talking about your book. Um, you have five different books. This is your most recent, which is The Seven Secrets to Healthy, Happy Relationships. So welcome. Oh, thank you so much, CJ, for having me on the program again. Thank you. How okay. are you? Good. I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited. I, I wanted to talk to you about um, self-mastery, which is one of the topics in your book. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the, your perspective, maybe of your lineage of how you think about um, synchronicity and, and you know, how to be in the flow of what's happening. And uh, even though it's been such a long time since our last interview, I actually remember a good portion of it because um, one of them was maybe the first book that you released. And I remember you saying to me, I'm like, are you excited? And you're like, whatever will happen, will happen. And I thought, oh my gosh, I can't believe he's so much. He's like, he's legit. He's like, yeah. literally, you're literally living and being the things that you talk about because, you know, being in the flow of life, what does that mean from, a, um, from your lineage? Oh, well, it's to be present. You know, uh, my grandmother always would say, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. You know, it's, it's a saying that she loved to repeat. Um, it's about completely being present. You know, it's about mm -hmm. engaging life as it unfolds. You know, for example, the image I sometimes have of this is of playing chess. Mm -hmm. You know, when you play chess, you often play 15 moves ahead. You know, you think of mm -hmm. all these possibilities in your mind. And then when you've decided this will be the better path, you play your play. And sometimes you play for a long time. My uncle, uh, Carlos, he's known to take 40 minutes to make a move because he, wow. he's, a neuro, he's a neurologist, so he's that kind of mind. So I always described it like this way. You think of all these possibilities, thinking about the future and how you want your life to go. And then the, your, the person you're playing, your rival, uh, does their play. Now, here's the thing. In their play, instead of, like, you can win in two moves rather than 15 moves. Like, all of a sudden, this play is, you can see it. It's right there. Just move here and there, and that's it. If you get upset because you got so attached to that 15 step that it was going to be epic, it's going to be beautiful, it's like it's incredible maneuver, and now you're upset because you won't be able to actually play it out. You know, that's that's how we uh, get attached to the what ifs of what we've planned. And at that point, we're completely rigid. Even when life mm -hmm. gives us such a wonderful opportunity, because we're so attached to this potential, this step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step plan you miss out you know mm. and you get upset even though in this particular example you might win in two and two moves um you you would have loved to have seen that play that you would have wanted and you were thinking of unfold mm. so life is that way sometimes we think of all these things life is going to take us here it's going to take us there if i do this i do that and it looks phenomenal and sometimes it goes for the worse, you know, all of a sudden, you, you know, like a year ago, like everyone had their plans on how it's going to go. And all of a sudden, COVID happens and everything shuts down and you have to uh, reassemble. You have to be flexible because if you're not flexible, you're not going to be able to make decisions that are pr in the, your present right now mm -hmm. in order to maneuver or survive or live. 
Mm. Same thing goes in the opposite direction. You know, all of a sudden, life gives you this wonderful opportunity. If you take it, it'll change your life dramatically as well. So both the good and the bad. And if you're so attached to it, it has to be this way, it has to evolve this way, then at that moment, that rigidity will make you, one, not be in the present moment, but two, miss out on what life is. Mm. And it's always changing. So that's the thing is that when you play chess, you're constantly revisioning your path. You're always thinking 15 steps ahead, but as soon as the other player, in this case, the, the image, the analogy is life, life makes a play, you restart all over again and mm. you restart before you make the next step. So sometimes life unfolds beautifully, neatly. Sometimes it gives you an opportunity that changes your life. Sometimes it gives you a moment where it dramatically changes everything in your life. And I believe we've all lived through something like that in the last year and a half. You know, some mm -hmm. people had an, an awesome opportunity. Some people had a devastating opportunity or situation. Being present or flowing with life is simply being aware that every moment in life is changing and the ability to be flexible allows us to stay well in our awareness mm -hmm. in how i want to live my life mm -hmm. and being able to answer that question with complete awareness so mm -hmm. we make decisions based on that mm -hmm. so we adapt we shift and you know, if you're attached to an outcome, well, it's always going to look different. So mm -hmm. it's all about what journey do I want to live in route or in route to that outcome, which is more enjoyable. Mm. So um, I'm wondering, I'll tell you about my own personal experience. It's very frustrating, you know, to figure out, to be present to what there's the present moment of what is like happening in your world. Then there's kind of this bigger, you know, there's all these um, circles, right? And then there's kind of the present moment of what's happening in the greater world. And they may not like, what's happening in CJ's world may or may not be related to like the general cosmos and what's happening. Mm -hmm. And so when you, <clears throat> when you talk about being an awareness and presence, right? You know, and I think that that kind of shifts over a period of time as you go along your spiritual path, <clears throat> so for example, it may have been um, in COVID, it's like, oh, I can't go on the vacation that I wanted. Okay, you know, mm -hmm. so it's very personal to the, wow, we're all trapped here in our homes and, and all of us are trapped and isolated and feeling imprisoned, you know, so there's this kind of um, kaleidoscope of awareness. So does, I don't know, how does that factor into the things that you were just talking about? Because there's your personal awareness in your own little bubble, but then the bubble is much greater than your own personal awareness. Well, it's, it's, we're part of a community and, we're, uh, and we are and we are an individual as well. You know, for example, um, I remember when everything shut down, I was a little frustrated because I was looking so forward to running a half marathon that was supposed to be run that weekend and it oh. went down. So I'm like, you know, the part of you that, um, oh, I invested so much of this work and all those months of training and leading up to this and it's not going to be there. You know, you get a little let down, but then you take a step back and see the bigger picture and you totally understand that it's for the good of the community to take to care of each other and one of one another in that situation at that moment, all the unknowns, everything we didn't know back then impacted. Mm -hmm. So at that moment is ability, one of the ways, best ways to reset yourself is looking, what are your priorities? At that moment, running a half marathon is no longer a priority. My, my priority right away is my family. In my case, uh, my wife and my two kids and my parents and my brother. So all of a sudden, I look at what is important. You know, it's, it's a, as a father and husband, that's, that was my, my shift. You know, all of a sudden, all my work went away in the sense that all, all the live events I was going to do is no longer viable. And, you know, we considered uh, 
uh, hazardous at a certain point of view to certain uh, people who are uh, susceptible. So at that point you realize, okay, I, I detach from that. But I also look at, all right, what is my, my main purpose now? Well, the health, physical and mental of my children and my wife and myself as a, as a family unit, my parents and all that. So now we, we shift and you know, we take care of them because now their whole world changed. You know, they went from going to school every day to not going to school and doing everything in digitally you know the those f- first few months every everything was chaotic you know the mm. some teachers were great at pulling it together some people were still trying to figure it out if you were technologically uh able and inclined you 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 had a much easier time those who were technically challenged had a much difficult time so you look at what you can control what is it that i am able to give how do you shift so that all comes down to, all right, what are my priorities? What do I need to do in order to help my family? How do I balance, you know? Mm-hmm. For example, I'm no longer doing live events for a while. So I went digital. So mm-hmm. how do I do that in a way that is beneficial? And of course, uh, financially, you have to take a huge step back because, all right, if you lived a certain kind of way while everything was working, now that I'm not working, I have to take a, a huge step back and let go of those uh, vacations, all those trips, because all of a sudden, uh, not only are they not healthy for you, possibly, uh, financially, it's not healthy. So, all right, how can I be able to survive and maintain for my family? And you shift, you, you adapt to that new reality. You know, it's, it's like anyone who gets downsized at work shifts their their lifestyle because if they continue that lifestyle they're not going to survive for that long you let go and at that moment being able to detach is an important gift because it allows you to f- let go of those things that are, are not necessary or not uh, not that important mm-hmm. the luxury things you can say and be able to see all right what is the most important thing food you know it, it's food uh maintaining heat in the house uh clothing to a certain point and uh getting the what's the right mask like in this case scenario it's it's uh it's all about being present once again mm. and making choices that reflect your priorities in life mm. and for me you know that i'm saying I'm, I'm i'm speaking as an individual whose particular journey was you know my 15 year old, a 14 year old, 15 year old autistic son. I would say 14 because he was 14 when this whole thing started, turned 15 in the middle of it. My daughter who is in middle school and had to learn how to go from being social to learning how to manage the digital social uh, scene, which she's managed pretty well to do that. And it's, it's, it all comes down with certain challenges. And after a while, we found that rhythm. We, we found a rhythm mm-hmm. that allowed us to help them with school and thrive in school. There's both, both of them are thriving at school. Oh, great. And uh, at the same time, helping my wife, you know, because she was, she's the essential worker, you know, and she continued to work. So I, can, I, I was holding on the fort at home and she went back to work. So how can I make her life easier when she comes home and all kind of things? So it's a whole readjustment and that is how you could, that was the immediate community for me mm. and then how I engage with other people was virtually and engaged a community uh, that was able to find that common ground and be courteous of people and yeah it's just finding that common ground so, so how did yeah. you how did you stay sane? So what I'm hearing is that you did three things. One is you got clear with what your priorities are, um, what your purpose was. Um, you got clear with what you could control, and then you learned how to shift and adapt. And associated with that, letting go. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you keep sane throughout all that? I mean, that's really challenging with like oh. two kids at home. I mean, how did you keep sane? 
emotionally sane. Purpose is always to heal uh, is the medicine for anxiety. Mm. You know, for example, an example of this, even before COVID, the, the anxiety I had, what's going to happen to my children after I die? You know, mm. it's like it's it's one it's, it's a concern that every parent has. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I've learned is that uh, the job us as a parent is to teach our children how to survive without us. Mm. You know, that's mm. it's a it's a big aha that I had mm. be, even before uh, the situation. Mm. Um, it's it's something that uh, in the movie Black Panther, uh, there, there's a scene that reflected that of a, of a parent. The, the main job of a parent is to prepare their children for their death. That I fail you, son. That's mm. the line as the father told the son, who is the Black Panther, about uh, no responsibilities. But when I heard that line, it just kind of clicked, you know, because at that point, uh, when you raising a child they go from you know from a child they, they you, you're taking care of them to keep them alive to educate them to feed them then you puberty hits and their teenage years are here and all of a sudden you realize the age of 18 is just around the corner and their life is going to happen how are they going to survive and that's when it dawned on me the job of a parent is to help them survive without you and then I, I read another book called How to Raise an Adult that kind of reaffirmed that belief. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. at that moment, I was, I was realized that's what the cure to anxiety as a parent is. If you want to heal the anxiety of what's going to happen to my kids if I die, teach them how to survive without you. Mm. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. so you know with COVID and all that it kind of accelerated it a little bit but uh, that's exactly what kept me from having a mental issue you know but taking care of their mental health it was very important so mm -hmm. that was the purpose mm -hmm. and it didn't drive you know there were moments of uncertainty but the way I see it is that it's just our turn you know every generation goes through some kind of turmoil uh, our great grandparents went through their situation during the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, their, my, our parents went through what happened in the 1950s and 60s, and so on. You know, every, we think about every person in our family through generations, and realize that most of them, actually all of them, survive. And many major situations in the world. Just mm. I'm saying in general, because everyone's specifics. Mm -hmm. It's just our turn. Mm. This is what we have to deal with, and we will move the story forward. Mm. And of course, uh, we had to confront our death. You know, I lost four uncles, one cousin that was almost like an uncle, and a classmate from elementary school to oh. this disease. Oh, it's it's, so it's sorry. everyone. Thank you. It's everyone's goes on skate, but it's something that we face our mortality and what's going to happen and what what is. Mm. Like I said before, the the cure to that is purpose. Mm. The purpose, uh, in my case, of helping my kids, taking care of them, helping my wife, taking care of her, and at the same time, taking care of myself because. I can't give what I do not have. So at one point I stopped being on the couch. One of the rules I had during this whole thing was every morning get dressed. You know, don't mm. stay in your pajamas, get dressed. <laughs> you know, that was that was the no if, if there was any instrument that kept me sane was don't <laughs> stay in your pajamas, get dressed. You know, and then we'll, you'll take care of whatever comes. So that's what it was. Uh, and what, what did you learn? Because, you know, so you walked in before all this event, contemplating how your children will survive. You have a child that has autism. And I know that, you know, that's like a great concern with parents that have kids with special needs. So what, in, in the end, like, and then COVID is just like an acceleration of that. Like we're all under this like depths of like, how are you going to survive? I don't know how my family's going to survive. I don't know how we're going to survive. I don't know how long this is going to last. I mean, how did, how did that, the external environment, you know, it's like this huge pressure. So you walked in 
probably in the beginning of COVID with this, and here you have a pressure cooker, <laughs> you know, forcing you to think about this issue. What deepened for you, or how did your understanding deepen, or was it just the, the experience just helped you understand your purpose even more deeply? Well, it's compassion. You learn compassion. You know, everyone is dealing with fear in their own unique way. You know, sometimes people rebelled, you know, some people, it gave a lot of people something to, you know, to control the rebellion and, and the pushback was their way to handle or, or get control of things. Mm -hmm. At the same time, in the opposite direction, taking care of yourself and, and creating the bubble was also a way a pushback in the sense of taking care of yourselves. Everyone handled it differently. Mm -hmm. you know, from fear mm -hmm. of grief or just the grief of all of a sudden you're you're how are you going to feed your family how are you going to take care of your family you know, because uh, the financial hit that a lot of people had was just as great if not it's just in a different manner of those of us who lost people you know it's it's mm -hmm. it's different you know the the sense of security what's going to happen next so like going check and check and the anxiety of that uh, you know, I had friends who had restaurants who closed because of the mm. situation. I've had, and, and everyone, their life was, I wouldn't say turned upside down, but it was shifted, it challenged. So having compassion is acknowledging that every single person is going to handle it in their own way. Mm. In regards to my son with autism, I basically realized that, okay, don't set him up for failure. You know, right now I'm actually protecting him. Other than, you know, people are tolerant and patient, but when there's fear involved, you have to be careful of not being able to trigger their fear with my son's behavior. So mm. I would not set him up for failure. You know, if, if we go to restaurants, you have to go to restaurants that, um, that, he was able to move around and at the same time teach my son about all the dangers and the possibilities of touching and mask. And he's pretty good about it. We, 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 we did a pretty good job with that of, all I have to say is remember COVID. Okay. I won't touch that. You know, that's, mm. it, it's, you know, as an, as my autistic son, he's very much into senses. So he mm. he's touching everything, everything. So before COVID, you know, we, we, we thought like, all right, well, he's developing an immune system, wash his hands, teach him all kind of thing. But with a situation that happens, it's more about the balance of keeping him safe and at the same time, not triggering others with his behavior. Mm. So we have to find that balance and find the compassion. People are getting triggered because they don't know, they don't understand, and that's perfectly fine. I understand, which is what matters. And helping my son navigate, so walking down the street, mm. doing all these kind of things. So it's 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 finding that balance of getting him out there and at the same time keeping him in here. <laughs> that's, right. that's been an interesting one, you know. And then my my daughter's just you know she's a teenage, uh, thirteen year old, so oh, she's that's has so her hard. Own stuff going right. through the things and and discovery and body changing and all that kind mm. of things. So. It's just being there, and that's where I'm. I'm. I'm, I'm very grateful to my wife for being there because she's, she's her, uh, her, her foundation in that sense. So it's, just, it's, it's they have that great conversation. So I'm grateful for that. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a time where, it's there's great blessings in the sense that, it's a, it's a time to be around people you love and reconstruct and recreate that relationship. Mm -hmm. it's a time for uncertainty in a sense like okay how am I going to be able to take care of my family and at the same time how I'm going to be able to continue to contribute because part of our what keeps us young and healthy and 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 alive is engaging society and creating you know and creating what we love to do be it with work be it with expression be it with interactions you know, it's, we are social people who are feeling the effects of being isolated. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm thinking of, of people of, uh, who really haven't been able to get out because they are immune compromised or their situation is completely different from other people. You know, I'm thinking of my father because he has, he has a heart transplant and he has mm -hmm. medication that suppresses his immune system so that his body doesn't reject his heart. 
Mm. So I know there's other people who are in a similar way or a little different, but they really have to be secluded in order to take care of themselves and the, the effects of isolation. Mm -hmm. And that is something quite real. Mm. So it's, it's one of those things, you know, that what to believe, what not to believe, but ultimately it is the human experience that allows us to have that compassion for one another and how we all react to it. Mm, so okay i love it so we've been we've been talking to dom uh, miguel Ruiz um about his book the seven secrets to healthy happy relationships and in the next segment i want to talk to you a little bit more about compassion because there's so much um suffering right now and division and um i'm wondering how we can use some of the five levels that you talk about to help us kind of figure out where we are on the spectrum and get us out into a place of more freedom and compassion. 